everyone. As advertised, my name is Arkoy Harris, and um, I am a senior director at Slack, and I run uh, customer acquisition and growth expansion teams there. Um, today, we're going to talk about managing up, and managing up often takes the form of advocacy, and that's either advocating for yourself or advocating for your team. Um, but managing up is also about leading with influence and how you can impact decision making um, in situations that are beyond your direct authority. Um, now, when talking about what managing up is, it's important to also talk about what managing up is not. So first, let's talk about what managing up is not. Um, managing up is not, um, is not sucking up, for example. So sometimes there can be situations where there is sycophantic flattery, like you're the best boss, you're great. Um, and that can really call into question your authenticity. Um, and so also managing up uh, is not about manipulation. Um, a lot of times people think that managing up is like mind control or something like that, but a really seasoned leader um, can see through that. And so I think you want to really keep in mind that managing up is not about like how to get someone to bend to your will. <clears throat> and lastly, managing up is not about empire building. Now inherent in managing up is this idea of self-advocacy or advocacy just in general, but you shouldn't view it as a mechanism to, or a vehicle to kind of climb your, claw your way to the top of the ladder. So now that we talked about what it isn't, let's talk about what it is. Um, inherent in the base of managing up is this idea of establishing trust. I think that if there is no trust, that will impede any attempts that you have. Uh, and so I think understanding that it's important to have that baseline level between you and the person to whom you're trying to manage up, that's, that's, that's key. It's pretty, um, very important. And the next thing is, is about influencing decision making. As I, as I noted, a lot of people think that manage, middle management is the toughest type of management because you have to manage both down and up and you're often having to influence decisions uh, over which you have no direct control. And so you should think of it as providing the necessary information to affect the outcomes that you'd like. And then lastly, it's about understanding the goals and anticipating the needs. Now, before you endeavor into any manage up, you should certainly know what the goals are. What are you trying to accomplish? But even better is to be anticipatory, to say like, I know there's a problem, I've seen it coming, here are ways that I can help impact the situation. Um, so next I wanna present a series of common scenarios. And I wanna provide some tools and strategies for how to successfully navigate through these common situations. All right, let's take a look at the first one. Um, let's say in this scenario, you have a VP of your organization and they need to make a decision. And the decision is which projects they wanna keep and which projects they wanna phase out. And you happen to have a lot of expertise in this area. So how do you influence this person's decision? Um, so first, the first thing that you wanna do is um, you want to focus, yes, so you want to leave with the point of view. Yeah, no, that's right. You want to leave with the point of view for sure. Any suggestion that you make should come with a recommendation. Uh, a lot of times you'll, you'll see situations where people will say like, we could do this or we could do that, or we could also do this other thing. I mean, you could technically do anything. Um, and I guarantee the person, the, your leader, your executive leadership knows what all the scenarios are. So a lot of times it's like, well, thank you, Captain Obvious for laying out all the things that I already know. That's not helpful. Right. Um, a better way to approach this is to say, we could do A or we could do B. I think we should do A and this is why, right? You're really trying to uh, lean on your technical domain expertise uh, in order to help impact that decision. Because since you are the domain expert, your opinion definitely matters in that situation. All right, let's look at another scenario here. Um, you have a very well-respected and well-intentioned executive. And this executive have, has really great ideas, but sometimes they make these really reactionary decisions that just wreak havoc within an organization. Um, how do you convey the impact of that behavior? Um, so the first thing that you want to do is you want to focus on the outcome. Now, 
I think a lot of times what people forget is that executives don't have the same context that you have, right? Like they might not understand the downstream effect or they, like all of us, they're really busy, they might not know. So you wanna really provide the specifics and you wanna focus on the impact. And for example, you wouldn't just say like, oh, you always come in and you cause a bunch of churn and you do all this stuff. And the exec's gonna be like, what? Like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I never do that. Uh, again, not helpful. But instead, a better way to approach it is to say like, look, just wanna bring this to your attention. That last quarter, you pulled the team off of the very important project widget and it resulted in a delay and that had a $10 million AR impact. And the executive might be like, oh, I thought that was just a really simple thing. I had no idea, but thank you for letting me know. Now, what you also want to come prepared to do is you want to also come prepared to provide solutions or be prepared to answer follow-up questions. And they like, might be like, what? This thing only took a week. How, how did it result in a, in a two month delay? And you might say, well, it, we hit a holiday season and people had to go on leave and then when translation got backed up, you know, you want to explain that there is definitely a domino effect to some decisions that might not be immediately apparent. Um, cause complaining is super easy, right? You gotta resist that temptation. Like, uh, if you just come in, you're just like, this was terrible again, not helpful. And then I don't think that's successfully managing up either. Uh, next scenario, you are trying to work on a project with someone and you have an issue with a cross-functional partner that is pretty, pretty demanding. Right, like they're not collaborative at all. And um, when they don't get their way on a very particular thing, they consistently pull rank. And so the question is, how do you ask your manager for advice without appearing inexperienced? Right. So this is a, a very common question uh, that I get and one that um, people often have issues with because as, as, as leaders, we're often looked to as the people who have all the answers, right? And everybody wants to appear as though they're in control and they don't want it to be like, oh, well, this person can't handle it. They have no idea, they're, they have no idea what they're doing. But we're also human and sometimes we need help and there's an effective way to ask for help while not really sort of hurting any of your credibility. So the first thing is you wanna come prepared. You wanna talk about the things that you've already done. All right, so so in this example, for instance, you might say, you might say, well, I'm having this really tough problem. Um, this person isn't particularly collaborative. Um, I've tried having a one on one with this person and we tried to work through the issues and that didn't work. And uh, I tried to initiate a, a unified roadmap so that we're aligned on the priorities. Um, still nothing. Right now, I think. The, the reason why that's really good is because you're you're really explaining to your leadership what things you've already tried, right? You're not just like dumping a bunch of problems into their lap. It's like it's like asking someone for feedback. Like, can I have feedback on this thing? It's like, well, on what? Like, where do I start? Right? You're really focusing the conversation on what it is that you need help with, um, and you're also showing that you did some diligence on your side um, and some like work just to try to like resolve the issue. And inherent in this also is this idea of escalation. Right, because in, in bringing it to your manager or, or your leadership chain, you are in a sense escalating and escalating isn't a bad thing. Right? I think that's part of it too. It's, it's you're just giving the leadership the information that they need um, in order to have the best context on the situation. And so in that situation, I would say like, hey, I tried all these things. I need your help on how, how I can resolve conflict or how I can get better in line with this person. Now, otherwise, I'm gonna be honest, it, it does look like you're just complaining. Like if you, if you just come and you're just, cause like, here's the thing, I'm not gonna suggest that there's never an appropriate time to complain. Sometimes you just need a vent. Sometimes you just, you're just going through it and you need someone to listen. But I think when you're doing that, you need to have established that uh, level of context and you need to establish that level of trust in your relationship uh, so that your boss understands the context of that conversation. Um, you know, cause what it, the vulnerability needs to have boundaries in some, uh, in some aspects. So that, I think that's kind of the technique to handle that situation. Okay, next scenario. So let's say you performed really well for a sustained period of time, and you think that you've met the expectations for a promotion. So how do you talk about your accomplishments to your manager without appearing arrogant? Um, 
before I answer the question too, it's it, it's important to really key in on one part of this is like, what is what does sustain mean, right? Um, means different things. If you are trying to go from associate to engineer, sustain could be a few quarters, right? If you are trying to go from senior manager to director, sustain could be years. So understanding that what sustained means, making sure that you've met the expectations of your role um, and that you have properly calibrated yourself. Um, so, so let's say, so again, you, you checked all the boxes, you've done the legwork, you do think that you are uh, sort of like meeting this, this bar. Um, how do you talk about your accomplishments? Now, a very common myth is that talking about your accomplishments is arrogant. We are just really nice people. We don't want to be bragging. We don't want to seem super boastful. Um, and just, it's like societal pressure. And we think if we just put our head down, we just work really hard, your boss is going to notice. And they're going to give you that promotion you've been waiting for. Nope, that just, just <laughs> remove that from, that is just not how it works, unfortunately. So here's the thing, talking about your accomplishments isn't arrogant. And you are helping to paint a complete picture. Now, um, I run a pretty large organization, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm a great manager. I'm, I'm the best manager. I don't ask anyone on my team, but really, I am like the world's best manager. It's true. So, <laughs> and even, I'm kidding. Uh, but even having said that, I can't know every single thing that you've worked on. I don't know every PR that you've done. I don't know every relationship that you've built. Uh, I, it's just it's just not really possible for a lot of executives, especially, to understand that context. And so you're not bragging, you're just trying to provide the context of like, hey, I worked on this thing, but let me just tell you something really specific about the things that I done, I did. Um, because I, I like to ask people, for example, in these situations, if I just swapped you out for any other person, like, would it matter? Like, what did you bring? Did you just execute on your job? Like, is it table stakes? Or did you actually do something that uh, is really impactful to, to the project? And so again, giving that context is not bragging, you're just giving context. Okay, so before we get to the Q&A portion, I want to make sure I have lots of time for Q&A. Let's get to um, sort of the conclusion, the main summary. So at a very foundational level, managing up is really about building trust. And there's many ways to build trust within an organization. It could either be um, with your actions or with the reputation of your work or, you know, just personal, just the relationship, the interpersonal relationship that, that you've built with, with the people to whom you're managing up. Um, but without that love, without trust, it's, it's really not going to work. It's kind of a non-starter because if, if you don't have some level of inherent credibility, then Again, people are either going to view it, they're going to view it as um, frivolous or, or sorry, like inauthentic is really the word that I mean. They're going to see through it and think, oh, there's another person just coming, sucking up, trying to manipulate me to get me to do a thing. Um, and so you have to, to have some level of sincerity and, and uh, intent uh, when, you, when you endeavor to manage up. The next thing is it's about prioritizing goals. You can't make a meaningful contribution in, unless you know the goals. So, for example, I, I see this happen all the time where people, uh, they, they will take this kind of self-interested stance where it's like, well, this is important. I'm just going to push this thing through. I'm going to I'm going to have my time in the sun and, and doesn't really matter if it aligns with anything else. I just want to work on the shiniest, biggest thing and I want to have like the most visibility possible. And an example of this is like, let's say you go and you pitch this thing and you're like, I have this great idea. Arcway, it's amazing. It's a great idea how to refactor the infrastructure and your executive is like that is a great idea i mean it would be great if our main target this quarter wasn't increasing arr by 50 percent right um like that would be great but does it help with that really important goal that we need that is important to the board and to our shareholders um so again so understanding the goals is super super important because without it it's just toothless yeah and then lastly managing up is about influencing decisions um Ultimately, you want to manage up because you want to be able to increase your impact and be able to influence decision making. Like that, that's otherwise why I bother. You could just go in your happy way and just kind of have this myopic view. Um, but it really is about being able to influence uh, decision making and Im impact sort of uh, outcomes, either about yourself or your team or the business as a whole. Um, and so really think about that as you sort of enter into these conversations and, and these scenarios. All right, so 
I think that kind of wraps it up for me. I think we're ready for some some Q and A. I'm very excited to see uh, what, you, what questions you all have for me. I'm here to ask. <laughs> Hi, Arque. It's been it's been so long, years. <laughs> I want to thank you for for sharing your knowledge and wisdom on managing up and self advocacy. Briefly, before going into questions, I want to share what my takeaways were. Uh, not sucking up was one that resonated with me because it's certainly one that I've sort of seen. Right, is when you're first getting into figuring out how to manage up or how to be promoted or whatever. People talk about like you were kind of alluding to talking about your accomplishments and you kind of have to like almost market yourself it's kind of like the way that I tell it tell it in my brain and that that's not the same thing as sucking up so I appreciate that and then the establishing trust piece you know all about having vulnerability right so your team feels safe to be vulnerable having a point of view focusing on the outcome being prepared I lo love all of that so with that I already see some some <laughs> questions that folks have teed up so and actually this one has quite a lot of upvotes this one's from Angie Huang what are some good ways to establish trust with a new manager coming into your organization that you're reporting to? Excellent. Um, I think that the best the best way it's it's like you, you've heard this adage that people don't listen to what you what you say they listen to what you do they watch what you do with your actions right. So the best way is to like just continue to to do good works and, and to take advantage of opportunities that you have to get in front of executives so for example i'll use an example from myself right um i always tell people like a good opportunity is to take advantage of skips and one-on-ones right like a lot of like you get a new manager and you have a one-on-one -on -one and it's like i don't know what do you want to talk about like no make them really focused really talk about things and and I used to have this this uh this manager that I used to work with and, and I'd have like kind of monthly skips with this person and every time I had a skip I'd go in and I'd be like hey you know I, I did this really great uh training with my team do you want to take a look at the deck or I gave a really good talk about like you know strategy and whatever and every single time I went in it was like it's like you're planting the seed right and then you know what happens over time they start to be like man look that arc play like she gets done done like she is she handles it and you're crafting your own narrative and it's not it's not in this kind of egotistical like look at me ideally you're you're showing and things that you've done that really help the organization and that 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 in that way your work speaks for itself right um the other thing is if if you're new in this organization as, as this question applies um I, I, I talk a lot about how you advocate for yourself and how you keep you should keep track of the things that you work on, for example, and take it with you from job to job, for example, because you get free sensi bias and you only remember the things that you did in the last 10 minutes. Um, when, when I get a new manager, I usually will share a doc with them of like my contributions of what the things that I've done and been like, hey, these are some projects that I've worked on and kind of walk them through some of the ways that you've been impactful. Um, just giving them that context. And they probably will appreciate that because they're, they're just getting in, they, they kind of are learning where the bathrooms are, they don't really know what's going on. Um, and you're, you're helping craft that narrative about yourself. Makes a ton of sense. Yeah. This, uh, this next one's from Anand Vaidyanathan. How do you give constructive feedback to your manager that the current role is limiting your career growth without futuristic vision for growth? Interesting. Um, this is a very complicated question because it very much depends on the organization, right? Like, um, because any promotion of any kind generally revolves around a business need, right? So let's say, let's say you do sales and you're like, I want to be VP of regional West or something. And it's like, well, we don't, that's not a role that we have right now, or that role's already been filled by someone who's doing great. Um, so sometimes, uh, like it's, it's just not possible. Like they can't just create a roll out of thin air for you. And, and and you get this a lot when you hit ceilings in organizations where it's like, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a VP unless, you know, it's like, I, I don't know where else I can go or I'm, I'm, a, I'm a director and we already have like three levels of VP. So sometimes it's very difficult to to um, have that happen. But, but I'll, I'll choose, let's say that that's not what you're talking about. Let's say that you're just in a role that just is not well suited for you or it's what you consider a dead end role. Um, I think that you should pick up on the advice of be specific, right? Talk about the why. Because if it's just like, I don't wanna do this or you know, maybe talking to your manager, that person can help really communicate to you the vision. Like you might be like, oh, you know, I, 
you know, every company I've ever been at, for example, I always love internal pools, right? Like that's my, that's my like heart team because they, they do so much and they're so underappreciated and you might be like, oh, I don't want to do internal tools, but your manager could be like, you know what? Those improvements that you made to RCI, that this is the impact on revenue and productivity for developers and the work that you do is super important, right? So it could just be having that, that conversation about why you think it's a dead end uh, and maybe you just need a fresh perspective. And then, you know, door C is like, or it's just not right you need to consider another like opportunity for yourself. Like you gotta kind of do that work and figure out if if it is a dead end and there's no other options, there's no alternative, there's nowhere for you to go laterally or up, uh, then, then yeah, maybe it's a hard conversation and the reflection that you need to have about maybe you need to pursue something else. Makes sense. A core tenant I'm hearing kind of from actually all of the different examples that you shared is kind of the tenant of authenticity and truth and sharing the truth and yeah. having the uncomfortable conversation, right? That a lot of people oftentimes don't want to have like in this question is just kind of this description of like how do I have this really uncomfortable conversation about something I'm not happy about right completely. Like, so many versions of that completely true you're doing great David by the way you are a great moderator um, <laughs> <laughs> it's true it's true I think and I think that's the thing I think that a lot of people just kind of feel like well I'll suffer in silence or you know, uh, like, and it's this whole constructive, if anyone's taking crucial conversations, it's what is a story that you're telling yourself, right? Yeah, and and just have the conversation because you're either gonna get an answer that you like or an answer that you don't like, but at least you'll get an answer. Totally, so I, I have an interesting reflection. This is just, again, from myself, but as it relates to crucial conversations, right? Like, one of the tips that I've, I've tended to give when having the uncomfortable conversation, besides just like girding your loins and just doing it, is, you know, this, you start by, they talk about, you know, making the space safe, right? Acknowledging, some people call it the shit sandwich, if you will, right? Say something nice, then say something you, then finish something nice. Like, but the, the thing that I, I, I found for myself that's been effective, which may only be because I'm a man or a white man, I don't actually know, is um, what I want to state, whatever the statement of fact is that I'm observing about you know something that I see that isn't going well, I lead in with my emotion about it before saying the thing because you can dispute facts, but you can't dispute emotion. So in other words, if I see that there's an engineer on my team that, or on someone else's team, let's mm -hmm. say, that is not pulling their weight, I can, I could just say, hey, so-and-so is not pulling their weight because they only put in X PRs and Y time, and you should do something about that, right? Or I could say, like, what's my emotion about that? I'm feeling concerned, or I'm feeling unrecognized, or I'm feeling um, like I'm in a toxic environment because X, Y, Z, you know, I'm, I'm curious for yourself, like, do you find that that kind of leading in with the emotion before the facts thing is, is a useful exercise? Has it has been useful for you, for others, or is it really sticking to the facts for you? I'm just kind of curious what your perspective is on that. I mean, I'm kind of like part robot, so I'm very much like a more analytical person. I, I, I'm escaping you right now, but there's this book about, um, it's like about statistics and stuff and how you shouldn't trust your gut Right, mm -hmm. because like your gut will lead in hiring. Yeah, yeah. In, every, in everything, right? Like you, yeah. just, you sort of are like you, you have this idea, and it's like that's not actually your gut; that's your bias, right? Totally. And so I your think, bias, totally. Yeah. I love that. And I think that for me, like it's like the fact from fiction, right? Because the the the, the emotion matters. You shouldn't discount it, but for me, it's not a, a guiding force because. A lot of times the emotion could be based on just like, like, you know, like your boss chooses someone else to, to lead a project and you're like, my boss hates me. I feel super neglected. And your boss is like, well, actually it's because you got the last three big ones. And I re recognize that you feel that, but that's a you story we tell. Totally. <laughs> right, exactly. It's like, it's like, maybe you have some deep work to do about why you feel insecure about this thing. And I'm not turning it back. I'm not saying that it's the blame, but it can lead you astray sometimes. Right. And so for me, I sort of like to think about it of like, okay, what is the story that I'm telling myself? Like express empathy. You know, why why do I feel like this person has wronged me so? What, what could have led this person to make this decision? Um, and then talk to the person, because that's the thing, right? Like, I think, um, but but I guess, I guess it, it, just like in most things, it depends, right? Because there's some situations where um, I, on every team that I've ever led, ever, at the core of every team that I've ever led is respect. 
-hmm. Like you don't have to be best friends and go out bowling after work or whatever. I mean, when we could leave, um, <laughs> you don't have to, you don't have to have zoom calls. Uh, <laughs> but, but you do have to respect each other. You have to respect yourself. You have to respect the work that you're doing. And so there are just going to be moments where let's say someone is just like blatantly disrespectful to you and you feel really hurt by that. That is not an emotion that you should ignore. And it is perfectly okay to leap at that. And there's just other cases where you really probably want to look at the details and the facts of the situation. Totally makes sense. We have a couple more minutes. Um, this question here from Alejandro Gr Grinberg. As a middle manager, how do you balance talking about yourself and about your team slash direct reports? Yeah, great. Um, I, I often, when people come to me and they say they want to make a transition to manager, uh, I'm sort of asking these series of questions. And, and part of it is being a manager is so hard and it's so thankful. And I like to ask people like you have to, in some ways have your fuel from seeing other people succeed. Right. Cause it, because then it becomes less about me, 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 and the organization that you represent and how you advocate for them. Now, I think that when you're advocating for yourself and generally like in a one on one with your manager or skip or something like that, it is OK to talk about the organization. But it, here, here is the fine line. Sometimes people go too, too far on the spectrum where they only talk about the, the accomplishments of the direct reports and it minimizes their impact. Right. So like maybe your, your team did this really great thing, but it was because you instilled this culture of innovation on your team and you allowed for 20 percent time or whatever to people do the thing. And you gave them like, you know, like you you facilitated that work to happen. So when I think about talking about the things that I've done, I think about, OK, like like would this have happened if did I do something to contribute to this? Did I facilitate this in any way? And if so, I talk about that. And otherwise I'll be like, oh, this person on my team had this really great idea. It was all theirs. Like, I'm super proud of them. Let's celebrate that person. Um, and I, but, but, but if you, but if you have contributed, I think it's okay to talk about how you did impact that, even if it's like as a technical architect or giving them support, whatever it is. Totally makes sense. All right. We have a couple more questions here. This one's from Timo Verlan. Do mm -hmm. you as a senior director set expectations to your direct or indirect reports to manage up? And how do you support and help them with it? Yeah, I definitely do. So um, every person within my organization, uh, including my managers and directors, um, I do this month long. Um, every month, everyone's invited to a week long invite called Career Growth Conversations. And in that week, whenever your one on one happens the fall, we spend that entire time talking about career growth. And we do it every month because sometimes you wait and it becomes like the big conversation and it's so stressed of like, I want to get a promotion and you're really scared. It's really charged. But if it's just like a thing that you do, it normalizes it. Right. And the conversation isn't repetitive. It's not like, am I getting promoted now this month? No, it's not that. It's more setting expectations like, like David, you know, I told you that you need to work on your communication. And last month you talked over Mary five times and this month you only did two times. Good job. Right. So you're, <laughs> you're improving. Uh, so you talk, you sort of like measure so that there's no moving of the goalpost. And then I also encourage everyone on my team to keep track of their accomplishments, like keep a running list of all the things that you did so that when review time comes, you just can't remember that thing you did at the beginning of the quarter or the beginning of the of the year. Um, and so it, it, we just normalize it. It is everything that you're doing, because because I hate to, at the end of the day, like this is a business and, and we are making contributions and we are all paid and we all love what we do, certainly. But, uh, but you know, part of it is making sure that you can make the biggest contributions and have the biggest level of impact. So yeah, so I definitely do encourage people and I encourage people, like I said, at every level, whether you're a G03 uh, associate engineer just starting out or whether you're a director who someday has aspirations to be a VP, it's important to make sure um, that you're consistently managing up and advocating for yourself. I love that. I, I'll make the only shameless plug of the, during the entire conference right now with you, which I feel because I feel comfortable with you, which is um, the startup that I'm working on Confirm is actually a platform to be able to track your accomplishments and share contributions and be able to recognize other people who don't always recognize themselves. Yeah. On a platform, then be able to like search on what skills people use and that sort of thing, like an HR inventory, so to speak, kind of platform. So I love that, that you talked about that. This was like a planned product placement. I, this was kids. I know, right? It's almost like I, I meant to do it. Uh, all right, last question. This one's from AJ Patalker. I've heard a lot about managing social capital as part of managing up. How important is this and what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, I mean, this idea of social capital, like it's, 
it's an interesting thing because it, it really kind of depends on what you mean by that, right? Like, because it because it almost implies that it's this finite thing that you're spending or not spending. And really, I guess what it has what it means is like, you know, your sort of like reputation, I guess, almost within within the company. And 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 so I think like I don't. Um, I think I, I try not to view things through that lens, right? Because because inherent in that also implies that like if you don't have a social capital, like should you not do it? Should you not speak up? And I and I kind of think that it should be uh, more agnostic than that. Now that said, I think like I think there are times to to sort of like use your your um, your position in order to sort of better the lives of others. I do this all the time, either with our ERGs or with, you know, speaking up for people who may not feel like they have a voice. Um, but I, I think I think that you should feel like whatever level that you're at, whether you have a ton of social capital or not, you're, you're always going to be put in a position where you have to manage up because there's always going to be situations that are beyond your control, whether it's, I don't know how to talk to the staff engineer on my team because I'm just, a, you know, I'm just a, a senior engineer or, uh, you know, I don't know, I, I need to sort of have a conversation with the director about a thing that they really need to know. Love it. Love it. Arquay, it's been so wonderful chatting with you, seeing you again, catching up again. <laughs> I want to thank you so much for your wisdom, your thoughts, your guidance. And with that, I wish you a wonderful day. Thanks, everyone.